recording. So welcome everyone on YouTube and on Moodle if you're watching this not live. Um, first off, exam dates. Um, the exam dates will be on the 21st of July um, and the re-exam will be on the 9th of the 9th. Uh, make sure that you register two weeks before. Currently seven people are registered and since we have like between 12 and 16 viewers, I think we should have at least a couple more people um, registering for the exam. Um, so do that. All right, so the assignments. So let's go through them. Um, today's like uh, the student data presentation will be on the 15th of July. Yes, yes. Um, as far as I can see, it will be on my birthday. So I will probably be wearing my birthday hat and eating cake during the entire lecture. Um, I'm sorry that we can't do it in person um, because then you could have all be eating cake, um, but but not a birthday suit. No, we're, we're not going that far. No, 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 no. All right, so let's switch to Notepad++. Um, let me scroll up a little bit. Is it readable or should I make it a little bit bigger? I think a little bit bigger might be better, right? Um, I hope that everyone can read it. Um, so lecture nine starts off with um, using the data from lecture number uh, six. So the first things is like the first things that we did, we already did in lecture six, right? So I'm just going to very quickly run through it and explain why we are doing what we are doing. But I think that if you would have done the, um, um, the assignment six assignments, then you should be able to load in the data and you should be able to take things like the log2 transformation. Um, but first off, just um, what are we going to do? So the first thing is, is that, well, we are loading in some data, right? So the first thing that I always do when I load in data is do some preliminary plots, like do a box plot, show me what is in each of the columns. Um, but because of the fact that you want to look at the data, you want to see it. Um, and that's the nice thing about R because it really quickly allows you to do some explanatory data analysis. So let's get me an R window and just copy paste in the first couple of lines to load in the data. Um, so of course I'm loading in the data. Um, I'm setting check names to false. And that is because when you open up the data set in a text editor, um, you see that um, the columns in uh, the data set array data, um, so the, the data which has the microarray data in there, uh, the column names start with a numeric value. And that is not allowed because column names have to be proper variable names. And a variable cannot be called 0, 1, 2, right? Because variables are names, so names always start with a character and not with a, a number. Um, so, um, just quickly for you guys, how does this look? Well, we have our array data. I will show you the first 10 lines that looks somewhat like this. Um, so you see that we have a description. So here we have things like the bright corner and the dark corner. So the bright corner is the positive control. The dark corner is the negative control. And then we have all kinds of probes, which we have measured. And of course, probes which have been measured have a sequence so that we can find where in the genome this sequence occurs. And then we have all kinds of uh, measurements um, so pit just the intensity values that we get off our microarray. Um, so as you can see, we have names like HT2010. And if we want to know what HT2010 means, then we have this other um, uh, we have this other matrix called arrays, um, which is kind of a description of the different names, right? So we have uh, a file name. So this is the name which kind of came from the machine. Um, then we have something which is called the Atlas ID, um, which is mapping to the um, data, fi uh, data file here. Um, and then we have things which is strain. So that means what type of an animal is it? Is it an inbred mouse or is it a F1? So a cross between two inbred mice. And you can see that we have three types of strains. So we have BFM mice, which are the Berlin fat mice. Um, and we have a B6N, which is the standard laboratory mouse. And besides that, we have F1 individuals, um, which are a cross between the two. Um, 
in the tissue column we see two different tissues, right? So we see HT for hypothalamus, which is a little part of your brain, and we see GF, which is the gonadal fat, um, which is the fat around your gonads. Um, and furthermore, we have then the individual ID, and you can see that the Atlas ID is just a combination of the two, but the individual ID is the IDs that we use in our mouse house. So that's the reason why we have the individual IDs there. All right, so the first thing that we want to do, of course, is make a couple of box plots, um, but of course we can't just do a box plot of the whole array data because the whole array data has this sequence column in there um, so there's two ways of doing this and there's a way which is easy and that's just saying like oh take array data right and then drop uh, column number one so just say minus one and this will drop the first column of course this is not really scalable right it might be that in the future we get a new data file or we add some individuals um, and the new data file might have like two or three columns before the data starts. So the better way of doing it is to say well we have this atlas ID column in arrays right so we want to just use this column as the index to the array data. So how can we do that? So we can say something like well take from arrays um, the column which contains the atlas ID. Right, so instead of throwing away the first column, what we are doing is we're very explicitly selecting the individuals which are in this column and then using this column as the selection criteria for the big data file which has all the measurements in there. Um, so if we look at this and let me look at a very small 1 to 10 right now we see that we have a matrix which only contains numeric values and we lost our first column. So two ways of doing it, but I don't really like the minus one system um, because that's not really scalable. While this is really scalable because you're just selecting um, the individuals from uh, the arrays and then using these individuals as an index to your data set, um, which I think is a little bit better. All right, so of course, like I told you guys, first we want to do a, a box plot. So I'm using, again, the same system. Um, this is kind of big, right? So we could have just said something like this and say, well, I, I do want to define a new variable called samples, right? And then instead of using arrays atlas ID every time, I could now just use samples. And that's, of course, a little bit better because now we have a new variable which holds this singular column. Um, but since it's not too bad, I'm just going to leave it as it is. So the first things first, we are going to make a box plot. And um, this won't surprise you guys because we already did that. Um, so let's switch back to the R window. Um, it will take a little bit of time. And um, the time is taken because there are so many outliers. So we can see that we have measurements which are around 0. And the maximum measurements are around 4 times 10 to the power of 5, which is like 400,000. Um, so you can see that the, the range of the data is very big, right? We can't see the box even for the box plot. So that means that the data is definitely not a normal distribution, right? So the first thing that we want to do is um, kind of draw this distribution yeah, because we have a lot of the probes on the array which are kind of off because most of the genes in the genome are not expressed at a given point in time while some of the genes are expressed at a very high level. Um, so the reason um, or the, the, the quickest way to solve this is to take the log 2. Um, so just do a transformation. Um, so I, what I'm doing is I'm just saying well apply and then would it be suitable to use Windsorize in the case of these outliers? No, no, because um, let me show you guys why probably Windsorizing is not going to work. Um, because if you do a, um, a, a single plot, right? So if we take instead of the um, all of the animals, we just take the first animal, right? And we just do a, a basic plot. Or now let's do a histogram, right? So if we look at a histogram, right, then we see that there's like a massive amount of data here. Um, let's add a couple more breaks, like do a hundred breaks on the on the histogram, and so you can see that there's a lot of genes which are not expressed, and then and we see that there's some which are expressed, and then we we almost don't see anything here. Um, why something like log two versus log ten? Well, in this case, it's more or less a, a given thing. Um, but 
Windsorizing won't work because then we're throwing more or less all the data away and this distribution is never going to be a normal distribution. Um, so let me show you the difference between a log2 transformation. So if I do a log2 transformation on the data for the first individual and I show you a histogram, right, then it looks like this. And this is still not a normal distribution, right? You can still see that there are, it's, it's kind of a, a two-part system, right? So you see that there's a lot of genes which are not expressed and then you see genes which are expressed, but now you start seeing that this starts becoming more of a normal distribution. Uh, a log 10 will do more or less the same thing, um, but the reason why we generally take a log 2 um, is because the distribution of a log 10 and a log 2 are similar, right? You just take a different base number. So it, the only thing that it does is change the scale on the bottom. And for microarrays, doing a log 2 is kind of the, the default. So um, that's just, it's kind of a historical thing. If people who did microarray analysis would have started with log 10 transformations, um, then we probably would have all used log 10. Um, but the thing to remember is, is that it doesn't matter if you take a log 2 or a log 10, um, but the, the thing is, is that it just changes the scale because instead of saying uh, y equals um, um, two to the power of x or saying y equals 10 to the power of x, um, the scale is just like a, a scale a scale of five, right? So here the maximum is five, while if we would do a log two, then we expect the maximum value to be around 15. So that's just because uh, the two and 10, there's like a five times difference in there. Um, but hey, of course we can see that it's still not a normal distribution, not a perfect normal distribution, but um, this is the thing that we kind of have to deal with, right? And we, we know this, we know that a lot of genes are not expressed um, and that, that's not bad. It's just when we start modeling it, we have to keep it in the back of our minds that what we are working with is not a normal distribution. All right, so um, let's go back to the code. And here in the code, we can see that because I don't want to do just a single individual, right? Like I did before, I'm just going to say, well, I'm going to take my data, right? Which is just this incantation saying array data, take the samples, and then I'm going to apply to the columns a log two transformation. And then the thing which I'm going to do is, is I'm going to directly put it back in the array that I had. So I'm going to override um, the array. Um, would override the data that I had. So of course, if I would do this two times or three times, then that would not be correct. Um, I can only do this one time because I'm destroying the original data by just copying the, the log two transformed data over the untransformed data. But in this case, it should be fine. All right, so let's do this and then make our box plot again, right? So to see if the box plots look a little bit better. Um, and of course they should, right? Because we already looked at the histogram. Um, but if we do a box plot, um, then we see now that, yes, indeed we see more or less what we saw before, but now we see a nice kind of normal distribution. It's that you still have the whole bunch of values on the bottom. So all of these means, um, if we, pull it out a little bit or let me just um, do LAS equals two to flip the axis around and now we can also read the names of the individual arrays. So LAS equals two just means go from a horizontal um, horizontal text on the x-axis to a vertical. Um, and so we see that the mean expression across the arrays is around five um, and we can see that the maximum is around 16 almost 20 um, and we see that on the bottom there are not really outliers, but that's just because these, this, this massive amount of non-expressed genes is kind of pulling the whole distribution down. Yeah, because normally if you, if you would have a real normal distribution, you would expect the, the vexus, so these, um, these things which stick out of the box plot, to be the same length. So if you would just look at a box plot and you see that, okay, so had this one has a very good normal distribution more or less, from five to around like two and a half and seven and a half. Um, but then you see that the distribution has a very long tail on the top and it has a very short tail on the bottom. So, and then normally you would, if the waxes would be the same, then it would be a real normal distribution. What we can furthermore see is that we still have some outliers. And of course these outliers, we could Windsorize away, right? Because now we're left with only a couple. 
Um, but we're not going to winterize, we're just going to take the standard approach for microarray data. And the standard approach for microarray data, when you see that it, the means of all of the microarrays are a little bit different, um, and I think last time we already talked about it, that you can see that in the hypothalamus, the average expression is slightly higher than the average expression in gonadal fat, um, and this has just a biological cause. So by doing a normalization, yeah, because we want to have a normalization, because we want every array to have the same average expression and kind of the same range in the expression. Um, so by doing the normalization, we are losing some real biological information. Because the, the, from this, from the biology standpoint, if we would see a picture like this, we would conclude that, well, in brain, more genes are active than are active in gonadal fat. But it's the way that it is. We have to normalize because we have to get rid of this uh, more or less effect where every array has a slightly different mean. Because if we would do modeling on this, um, then we would find like thousands and thousands of genes being different between the different samples. And that's kind of, that's, that's not really true because that has just has to do with the amount of DNA that has been brought on the microarray. So let's do a normalized quantiles, which is the standard way of normalizing it. Um, so again, the same thing. I'm, hey, I'm just going to copy paste it in. So here we see the normalized quantiles function, which comes from the pre-processed core package. Um, and this will normalize our data to make sure that every array has the same mean and that the quantiles, so the, the, the first quantiles and the second quantiles are more or less smoothed out across all of our arrays. And again, I'm going to do this destructively. So I'm just going to copy it back over over um, the original data directly. All right, so let's do that and then do our box plot again to make sure that the data really looks good. And then after that, we see that indeed now it has normalized the way all of the differences because every microarray now has the exact same average value and it has the exact same variance. Of course, we now lost some biological evidence because here we now see that the gonadal fat samples get pulled up and the hypothalamus samples get pulled down a little bit. Um, but uh, we can't really do anything about that besides splitting the data set in two and keeping the gonadal fat samples separate from the hypothalamus samples, which if this would have been a real analysis, you probably would do. Uh, you would probably have to um, do the gonadal fat and the hypothalamus samples separately. All right, so the next step is then to do your linear modeling, right? Because have we, the lecture was about linear modeling. So the question was really long, right? So use linear modeling to detect differentially expressed genes and then make sure to compensate. Um, but I want to show you guys how I would normally build this up. Right, so the first thing that I would do if I want to do a linear model, I would say, well, I need to have one set of measurements, right? So the one set of measurements that I'm going to take is just the, the, the third one on the array, right? Because the first one is the, is the positive control, the second one is the negative control. So I'm just going to take the first one, which has some real data in there. So that is number three. So if I just look at number three, right, then I have a vector of data, right? So you can see that it just has measurement values and of course it, it because I'm taking one row of a matrix it kind of automatically becomes a vector so I can call this y right so I can just say y is this thing right so this is the thing that I want to predict now what do I want to use to predict well the thing that I want to use to predict is I want to know if the strain or the tissue has an effect, right? Because we have strains, so we have BFMI, so fat mice, we have standard laboratory mice, and we have different tissues because we have gonadal fat and hypothalamus. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to do is say, well, I'm going to define my strain, right? So I'm just going to take the strain column here um, from arrays, and I'm just going to give this a name. So I'm just going to call this strain, right? And then I'm also interested in not the strain, but the um, but the, the, the tissue. So let's take the tissue column out and put this in its own variable called tissue. All right, so now I have everything I need to do linear modeling. I have a response variable and I have two different predictors, one which is the strain, one which is the tissue. So the first thing that I'm going to do is see if everything works. So I'm just going to type LM and I'm going to say, well, take my Y as my predictor and now use, for example, strain. So, oh, 
and then I get a invalid variable list for y and that is because it is still a matrix it's still a matrix which has one row and many columns so let's solve that and just say as numeric right so I'm just gonna force it to be a numeric value and now when I look at y it's now really a vector so it lost the the column structure and the row structure it now just values um, and now when I do my linear model um, it will tell me well this is interesting uh, strain here is now interpreted as a factor right because it has three different levels um, so it has b6n bfmi and f1 and when I do my model I see that well it gives me back what what I gave it right so the formula is the prediction of the microarray intensities based on the strain um, and I get an intercept back I get a strain BFMI effect so this is the BFMI effect relative to the default group and fortunately for us it, the default group that it chose is actually the B6N right because I have three groups but I only get two effects back so I get an effect of the BFMI relative to the B6N and I get an effect of the F1 relative to the B6N. So these effects, when you use a, a factor variable or a, a variable which has, is type factor, um, then it will always give you, it, uh, give you the values relative to the base value. But what the base value is, is something that you can determine yourself. Um, because if we wanted to get the effects relative to the BFMI, uh, we have to do something like this, right? So we could, would say that now when we look at the strain, I want to just say, well, this is uh, a factor, right? So I'm now going to force it to be a factor. And I'm going to say that levels is C. And then the first level that I specify is going to be my default level. So I have BFMI, B6N and I have F1s and then I'm going to do it like this and now when I do my model it will now give the effects relative to the BFMI so I can determine what is going to be the default if I don't specify a default it's going to be the first thing that it sees in the column is that clear? I hope so right so you can see that the effects just get flipped around um, but of course the F1 effect is now completely different than before and that is because it's, it's now relative to the BFMI um, but of course I want to have it relative to the B6N because that's our more or less laboratory mouse so the default mouse so let's flip that around so I want to have BFMI as well so let's put in the BFMI as well right so now I can do my model again and now I see that everything is nicely relative and now the F1 is mentioned first but that doesn't really matter right you can see that the effects are still exactly the same it's just that the order has changed all right, so let's extend our model, right? Because strain is not the only thing that might influence our phenotype. Um, it might also be that the tissue is influencing it. So we can just add tissue as an effect. So we can say linear model where we say that the expression of this one single probe on the microarray is determined by the strain of the animal and the tissue that we're currently looking at. Um, and then we see that when we do that, we see that the F1 value doesn't really change the BFMI value doesn't change and the tissue doesn't really uh, and the tissue is the new effect that we see but because these two estimated parameters haven't changed at all we know that these things are not collinear so when we designed our experiment we did a good job um, and we didn't measure only hypothalamus in F1s and only brain or and only gonadal fat in for example BFMIs and so when effects start changing between two models, right? So from a model where you have one effect compared to a model where you have two different um, variables predicting, um, if you see a big change like we saw in the last lecture, um, then there is something which is called collinearity. But in this case, because the effects are the same, we can assume that there's no real collinearity in our data, which is good because that's kind of what we want to see. All right, so we have the uh, coefficient. You see that the intercept changed a little bit, and then we have our effects. Of course, we're not that interested in the effects. We want to know if there's anything which is significant, right? So if we want to look at significance, um, then I'm just going to save my model called M1, um, or model, or my model, but M1 is because it's the first model that we're making. And now I can use the ANOVA function on M1. Um, and then we see that the strain, although it has an effect, right? Because there's a difference between the strain compared to the BFMI um, or compared to the B6N, so compared to the reference mouse, we see that there's no 
real evidence for this to be significantly different. Um, what we do see is that based on this first probe on the array that we're looking at, we see that there is evidence, significant evidence, that the tissue is playing a role in the expression of this gene. So that's good to know, right? So in this case, the, the mice strains are not different. So all three mice have more or less a very similar expression. Um, but what we learn is that the tissue is very different from one tissue to the other tissue. All right, so now I've set everything up to start doing it on mass, right? Because I don't have one probe on my microarray, I have a bunch of probes, like 20, 30,000 probes. So that's the first thing that we need to do. So the thing that I'm going to show you now is the, uh, the, the code that I wrote before, and you can see that it follows the exact same structure as what we had before. Right, so instead of, so we're taking Y, we're doing the strain, we're doing the tissue, then we're doing our model, and then we just do the ANOVA on our model, and I'm taking out the PR column, right? So the probability column, because I'm, I want to know the probabilities, and I'm not so much really interested in the effects, because first I want to know which of these 20,000 genes are different, and once I know which of these 20,000 genes are different, I can then drill down in these genes and see what the difference exactly is. So I'm just going to remember the probabilities. So the way that I'm going to do that, and like I first wrote this piece of code, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go uh, put a big for loop around it. I'm going to say for x in 1 to the number of rows of array data. So just go through this whole big matrix one by one. And of course I need a variable to store my results in and I call that results. And of course, every time that I do this model, right, because um, if we go back to R quickly, right, and I would say um, do this uh, probability F thing, right, because what I want to get is I want to get this column out. So if I look at this column, um, oh, um, it's called M1, right, then now I get the, the three different P values. Why do I get three different values? One which is missing, right? Um, this is because we also have the residuals here. So the residuals, they don't have a probability because they're just there. So the probability will always be NA. But there you can see that I can just use these two values. So the thing that I'm going to do is I am just going to, for every row in my big uh, matrix, so my array data, I'm just going to take these values, so this part, and I'm just going to row bind it, right? So I'm just going to make one big matrix which contains all of the results because for every every test that I do I get three values back so I'm going to have a matrix in the end which has three columns and of course the number of rows of this result matrix will be equal to the number of rows of the original matrix. Um, so when I look at Notepad++, this is what I kind of did. Um, so you see that I have my results variable and every time I do my model and then I take this, this column from this matrix and I just row bind it to the results that I already had. All right, and then of course I can add the column names. So I can add, well, the first, the first column contains the p-values for the strain. The second column contains the p-values for the tissues, and the third column contains the p-values for the residuals, which will always be NA, but still we have to give it a name. Um, and then, of course, the row names of the result will be the row names of the array data, right? Because, uh, because when I'm just row binding, it won't give me any row or column names. It will just make a big matrix, but I have to know in which row, which probe I did the test for. All right, so let's run this. This is going to take a little while. Um, so um, let's go to the R window and let's just run it. And this will take some time. So are there any questions so far or is everything clear? Right, so you see that when I when I build up something like this and the, had the, the question was pretty long yeah, because it, it, it was like, I can read the whole question, but that's a little bit nonsensical as well. Um, but hey, you can see that I do a step one by one. So first things first, I'm going to just take one of the things, put it in Y, and then model it using the strain and the tissue. And once I have working code in R, I generally copy paste the working code from R to Notepad++ and then put a for loop around it just to do it for all of them. Hey, but originally, I always look at one. If it works for one, it's probably going to work for all of them. All right, so this will take a little bit of time. So. 
because it's a big data set, right? Like there's there's a lot of genes in the in the genome, um, and for each gene we need to do our test. No questions so far. That's good. Was everyone able to do this? Um, I know that Testosaurus, my new moderator that I just promoted to moderator, actually did it, right? Were you able to finish the whole thing with the two tips that I gave you? I hope so. I hope so. Why, why the smiley face? You were, you were either able to or you were not able to solve it. Right? In the beginning you just, not finish, but almost. Okay, but then, like in the beginning you just try to do too much. And I think that's very common when people start programming is that they want to do too much in one go. Right, so they are they, they instead of thinking themselves and breaking the problem down into very small subproblems and then trying to solve the individual subproblems, what people generally do is when they're faced with a big question like this, um, they go to Google. They Google, they end up on Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow gives them like 30 lines of code. Um, they copy paste these 30 lines from Stack Overflow and then start modifying it to try and have it work for their analysis. But that's generally not the way that you want to work. The, the way that you want to work is really start from nothing and then do it step by step. So take a single marker or take a single probe on the array and model that. And once you're able to model a single probe on the array, then just write a for loop around it and do it for all the probes on the array. Taking a while though, and that that's on a like six core machine, although I'm not using six cores. I could have wrote it in parallel as well, um, but that's gonna be a little bit more complicated. Hi mom, yes, Twitch live lover, you're, uh, hi. Well, I'm not your mom, but someone has to say hi back, right? Otherwise it's just not fair all right so we're waiting and we're waiting um, so actually while we're waiting I got a new toy and I wanted to show you guys the toy um, and since we have some time now um, I'm just gonna play with it so I bought myself one of these drawing boards because I can I can draw stuff for you guys um, so I'm also doing the, the, the like new layout. So this will be the layout next year. So next year is going to probably very likely. Oh, let me, I have to switch it here then as well. Um, so the, the layout next year is uh, probably going to be um, something like this. And of course, then we will have like pandemic edition, um, like three. Show the picture and let the chat guess the age of the artist. Which picture? You mean, you mean, ah, all right. Okay, chat, what is the age of the, the person who drew this? Why did it move? I don't like it moving. Like I know that, that like I, I like it a lot. Like it's, it's clear and it works really well. Um, let me let me switch back to this one. This is the new coffee break gift for next year. 25, 30. Oh my god. How old do you guys think that I am actually? 26. That's a that's an interesting. Like you guys know that on the 15th is my birthday, right? I told you that. Um, it's from a child, guys. No, it's not from a child. 31. Denny is 31 years old. You are 35. Oh my God, you guys are so, so, so generous. That's, that's so generous. I, 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 I like the fact that you guys all think that I'm like early 30s. <laughs> I'm, I'm not early 30s, not, not, not by a long shot. I will be 38. So, uh, yeah, that's bad. But yeah, the new drawing board. So next year we'll probably use it a lot because I like it a lot, right? Because I can do things um, like um, just use a pen and then um, I wasn't that far off. No, 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 no. 
but but next year like instead of using the board behind me to do all kinds of scribblings that you guys almost cannot see I can just draw like a little graph for you guys and then yeah, like the, the, the difficulty here is that with the new like tool I or the toy it's not really a tool it's more a toy um, and, but I can do like dots and then I can make like a nice graph and I can show you guys like oh look there's a like linear connection between two things um, but that, that's just for next year and um, it actually finished so very good very good very good so let's go to the R window all right, so we see that it finished. That's really good. So let's put away the toy. Um, and um, if we look at the results, right? And this is the first thing that I do. So I just say, give me the first 10 rows of the result. Yeah, so like like we predicted, we can see that the residuals are NA. Um, here we see that there is um, P values in here. And we see that the tissue is, is looking like it's very, very significantly causing differences. And we already knew that, right? Because just by looking at the first box plot, um, I will come back next year. Well, I hope not. You, you, if you pass the exam, there's no reason to come back next year. Um, you're more than welcome to, of course, but... Uh, <laughs> but, but, but <laughs> you're more than welcome to, but um, if you pass the exam, then there's no real need. Unless you want to learn the same stuff again, or kind of again, um, but we'll have to see. Um, I, I, there will be more new stuff, of course, because R does change. All right, so let's let's continue with the assignments because otherwise we'll be drawing and talking the whole time, which is fine. But um, I do want to finish the stuff here because then we can switch to the nice stuff, right? I will for sure be around again next year. Why do you say that, General Gulag? Do, don't you don't you trust yourself that you'll be able to pass the exam? Like, it's not going to be a very difficult exam, um, and. Actually, this year you guys are probably very lucky because it will be an online exam, meaning that it's slightly easier than doing it in person because you don't have me to kind of distract you guys and walk through the rows and watch while you're writing stuff. Um, oh, just to freshen up knowledge. Okay, yeah, no, that's always a good idea. Um, of course, like the videos are on YouTube as well, so you can just freshen up on YouTube, but. Um, I, I, I would love you guys to be here next year as well. Like the more people watching, the more fun it is for me as well. All right, so now we can start answering the questions that were there, right? So the first question that we had was how many genes are differentially expressed between BFMI and B6N mice? Um, that is actually a question that we cannot answer with the analysis that we just did because we only know if there's a strain effect. So let's see if that's something that we can answer later on. Um, why did I ask that question? Because that's a question that you can't really answer by using linear modeling, because you have to do post hoc tests then. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So f the first thing's first, right? Because we did 20,000 tests or somewhere around that. We have to adjust for multiple testing. So adjusting for multiple testing can be done using the p-adjust function. So I'm just going to use the p-adjust function to adjust um, based on the amount of multiple tests that we did. So I'm just going to say, well, take the results, take the strain column, take the tissue column, and then just use the p-adjust function to adjust for the number of tests that we did. And the p-adjust function will use the most um, restrictive um, adjustment so it will do Bonferroni correction by default um, but you can tell it to do different methods as well so it has a parameter where you can tell it well I want to use Benjamini Hochberg right so it, it depends on which error you want to optimize but in this case we want to optimize for the type 1 error because if we say that this probe or this gene is differentially expressed then we want to make sure that that's really the case Right? And we don't want to optimize for kind of a 5% false discovery rate. No, we want to be very stringent because we have a lot of genes. So it's better to lose a couple that are really different, but make sure that the ones that we have are super significantly different compared to the other way around. Because hey, we don't want to end up with like thousands and thousands of genes that we have to look or further investigate. So I'm just going to use the the adjustment function so I'm gonna say adjust my strain results and adjust my tissue results and then override the results that I had um, so I'm just gonna do this and when we then go to R um, so 
And in R, I will just keep this part here. Um, so adjust the p-values. So now when we look at the first 10 results, um, you will see that it has changed a lot. Right now, all of these which had non-significant p-values before now end up having a p-value of exactly 1. And you can see that some of the other ones, hey, which were not that low, now also got adjusted back to 1. But you can still see that there are some probes on the array which are still different, right? Um, so how many are still different? Well, if we want to know, so if we want to know how many there are, we can now just use our standard threshold of 5%, right? Uh, so I'm going to say which of the strain or which of the strain p-values are lower than 0.05 and this will tell me how many genes are different between the different strains that we are looking at um, and of course when I do this it will tell me a big vector of true false true false but I want to know how many there are so I'm going to say which ones right because this will give me the indexes back so if I do it like this it will tell me which ones are differentially expressed but I'm interested in how many so I'm just going to ask for the length right so then I have a single number and it tells me that there are 418 which are differentially expressed uh, between the different strains so if I want to do tissues right I can do the exact same thing but instead of using the strain column I'm going to use the tissue column and that tells me that there are 17,000 genes which are different from gonadal fat to hypothalamus and that is a lot right we know that a mouse has on average like 25,000 genes um, but of course in one case we have brain tissue where a lot of genes are active and in the other case we have fat tissue in which only a limited amount of genes are active um, so it might be true that there's really 17,000 um, genes or probes which are targeting genes which are different in this case all right so the question then becomes, um, what is the major pitfall when looking at genes differentially expressed between the two species? So, anyone in chat, what, what is the major pitfall here? Hey, what, what can we do wrong? We have some solid, quiet airtime for you guys to think. All right, so let's go back to the drawing board. I'm, I'm just going to draw this for you guys, right? So that you, uh, oh, um, let me take the drawing board. All right, so let me swipe this away. No, don't do it like that. Give me the pen again. I don't know why it changed. I had, I, I had practiced it a lot, but now all of a sudden the entire layout in, in, in Office has changed. So let's just get rid of all of this stuff. All right, so we're looking at a gene in three tissues, right? So first off, we can have something like this, right? So imagine that when I look at the BFMI, uh, no, we have two tissues, right? So if I look at the BFMI, right? And if I look at a gene, then it might be that the gene is in gonadal fat and we have hypothalamus. I'm not that good at this. So it could be that here in gonadal fat, in the BFMI, we have very low expression and in the hypothalamus, we have very high expression of this gene. But now when we look at the B6s, Right? We could have, again, we have gonadal fat and we have hypothalamus. We could have the opposite direction of effect. Right? So in the BFMI, it's low in gonadal fat, high in hypothalamus, while in the B6, it's high in gonadal fat and low in hypothalamus. Of course, when I combine this data, right, then one of the major pitfalls that we can run into is that kind of in the model this gets averaged out and now how does it look well if we look at the tissue uh, if, if we look at the effect right then the effect does consider the different tissue but in the in the end what it will do it is uh, it has like two values here 
and it has two values here. Now when I compare this then it will kind of notice not the difference anymore because in one case we have a positive beta estimated and in the other case we have a negative beta estimate and now these two can cancel each other out and now we don't find an effect so in this case this might happen in our data right because that that might be the case um, yeah, so we might have a, an effect where in the BFMI we see a positive relationship where hypothalamus has higher expression than gonadal fat and the other way around um, we can see that in B6 we have a lower yeah, but now by combining these two data sets and giving the model both the data of the BFMI and the B6 when it does a test to see if gonadal fat is different from hypothalamus it has measurements for gonadal fat in both BFMI and B6 and it has the same thing for uh, hypothalamus of course but the problem now is is that these two average out because the positive beta in the BFMI is cancelled out by the negative beta in the B6 so this this is something that can happen and this is one of the major pitfalls when you do more complicated models not a model which is dependent on a single thing but on multiple things and this is something that is really really hard and really really difficult to to kind of compensate for. So there are other ways to compensate for this um, and one of the ways that I generally try to compensate for this is that to is calculating a model for the tissues and then correct the data first for the tissue effect or do it for the different strains right depending on what we want to do right so first things first I'm doing the same thing but now I'm using the residuals and then taking the intercept and adding that back in right because we know that once hey, when we do a model a linear model where we only have one effect right the tissue effect then we have a single straight line through the data and then we can have our residuals and then we can use these residuals to make an adjusted phenotype so we we pull out one of the effects and by pulling out one of the effects first and then looking at for example doing a t-test between the three different strains we are much better able to figure out exactly what is going on. So, and this is just a way that you can do that. So I'm just going to show you, because here I'm just wanting first to adjust my measurements. So I'm taking again the measurements, calling them Y. Then I'm making a model where I say that Y is determined by the tissue. And then I have my model. And now I take from my model my residuals. So this is the phenotype after correcting for tissue. And I'm adding back the coefficients, the intercept, because that's just the mean of the probe that I want to add back in, because I don't want the expression to be centered around zero. Hey, but if the expression used to be seven, then I want the average expression to still be seven. So I call this phi core, which is the corrected phenotype, and then I just make I just bind this to my corrected data. So what this does is just it runs through the whole matrix again, one by one. And then what it does, it, it adjusts the um, phenotype based on which tissue we are looking at. And then I can just use basic t-testing because now I only have one factor left. Um, and this factor has two levels. So then what I'm going to say is, well, which of the strains are BFMI? Which of the strains are B6? And which ones of the strains are an F1? And now I'm going to go through the corrected data and then I'm going to correct, take the corrected values for the BFMI and then do a t-test between the BFMI and the B6N. And I'm doing, going to do the same for the F1 to see if the F1 is different from the BFMI. And I can also test, of course, the F1 versus the B6N. And here I'm going to combine them first. So yeah, because now I want to have two p-values here. So I'm going to say, do the t-test, remember the p-value, combine this with the p-value of the other test and then hey, I'm going to say this is a new variable called one row so this is the adjusted data t-tested BFMI versus B6 F1 versus BFMI and then I'm going to add it together and then I'm just going to give the column names at the end after I made my matrix and this is a slightly better way of doing it because now we can't have this pitfall where two of these things cancel each other out because in one tissue or in one strain you see a positive tissue effect and in the other strain you see a negative effect between the tissues so this is another way of, of doing it but that we are first taking a correction so we take our phenotype we remove one of the effects and then we do t 
t-testing. We could have also done this using linear regression again, yeah, but in this case, since we only have one factor left, um, we can then just do a t-test between the different groups of this factor. Um, and then, of course, we have to adjust for multiple testing again. And now I can actually answer the question that was in the assignment and say how many genes are different from BFMI to B6 and how many genes are different between BFMI and the F1 individuals. All right, so let's run this code and then we can see how the corrected data and stuff looks like as well, right? Um, so then we can make some plots. Again, this will take some time. I see that my original moderator is back as well. So welcome to the lecture as well. I hope your meeting went okay. I actually modded um, Daniel as well. I should have modded Skrita, but I don't think that Skrita is here today. So that's a shame. I want it to be really evil. And <laughs> but All right, so, and so we're correcting. So again, this will take some time. Oh, let me switch to the R window. So we're just correcting the data. So I just copy pasted the data in. So, and hit, this will correct our data. Um, and, oh, she is, good, good. Then I can unmod you and mod Skarita. <laughs> right, but and so correcting data is a valid way of getting rid of an effect. Um, and had, like I showed you guys in the simple drawing is that if two effects are opposite to each other you cannot find this effect because they cancel each other out. There you are. Very good. <laughs> all right, so it, it will take a while. Did we have any more assignments? I think these were all of the assignments, right? I think those were all. Um, I had some free questions there. Oh yeah, we are still at question 4b. Is it valid to use linear modeling on this data set? That should be something that you could answer, right? Because we looked at the data. Um, so the question is, is it, um, is it okay to use linear modeling here? So this is just a yes, no question. So you can just throw yes or no in chat and like you don't even have to have done the assignments for this. I will start. I will start. I will say this is my answer. <laughs> A lot of people sleeping today. Yes. Oh, Testosaurus, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. <laughs> but no, of course it's not valid to use linear modeling here. Earlier, one of your award-winning moderators for dumbness timed me out, and I don't know why. Explain yourself, mod. Yeah, explain. Why did why did you why did you time out one of the viewers? Because there there was no reason, I think, for a timeout. Um, but hey, of course, it's not valid to use linear modeling here. Um, when we looked originally at the data, um, what we what we saw is that there is no normal distribution. Right? We see that there's a big hump of, 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 of things which are zero, and then we see that there's a very kind of broad um, uh, normal distribution. This is what happens when you give your students too much power. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I shouldn't give... Uh... See how insulting he is. He's not insulting anyone, and how do you know he's a he, or even like assuming his, his gender? Yeah. Anyway, no timeouts for, for Twitch Live Lover. Twitch Live Lover is good. You can you can watch and you can stay and that's so binary. <laughs> Alright, it's still correcting the phenotype data, but um has so Based on the original data that we showed you guys, right? So if we look at the histogram across, um, we can see that the histogram is 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 problematic it's not a normal distribution. So linear modeling in this case will probably be not be the correct thing to do. Um, yeah, because if a gene is not expressed in one tissue, but it is a little bit expressed in the other tissue, then we already get a significant p-value, which is why we ended up with 17,000 genes being different between the two tissues, which is just a, a too much. Um, it can't be that between brain tissue and fat tissue, there are 17,000 genes which are different. Um, so, 
Testosaurus 3K shouldn't be a mod, to be honest. You're not even considering giving him like a second chance. Like he he he, he timed you out. I'm I'm agreeing with you. He shouldn't have timed you out at all. But of course, it's his first day as a mod, so he 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 he, he probably just didn't know how to do how the controls work. But yeah, so I demand an explanation and he called me evil. That's actually true. That's actually true. Um, he is now reporting for mobbing. What? Why? Why? I'm 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 going to uh, um, do uh, something like uh, timeout. All right. Let's let's put Testosaurus in timeout. Let's focus on the lecture. I I, I agree. <laughs> All right, we adjusted data is finished, right? So the data is now adjusted. So now if we look at the corrected data, uh, one to 10, and we look at the original raw data, which is stored in, let me see, um, array data arrays. Right, so we're just going to look at the array data. We're going to say one to ten, comma uh, one to ten, comma. Throw away the first column. Right, we can see that there, there it, we adjust it. So there is an adjustment, and you see that some hypothalamus samples actually got adjusted more or less up. Right, because it was or uh, down, it was 1.4, and now they're adjusted to like 1.3. Um, and you see in this case that the gonadal fat samples haven't changed at all. Um, and that is, of course, because one of the groups is going to be the um, uh, is going to be the uh, base group. All right, no one's going to go to goodbye. So don't don't fight in chat. Like everyone can make mistakes. It happens. Um, all right, so let's let's look at some of the adjustments. So let's take the third column and do a plot, right? So these were the original measurements. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Let's do an as numeric. Numeric. I'm having a hard time typing today. So, and then let me do x oct is non axis. Oh. Right, so I'm just trying to make a nice plot for you guys so that you can show the samples and then the adjustment. Um, so the first thing is, is that I want to... Why is it not disabling the x-axis? x-lap, x-oct. You should disable the x-axis. I don't know why, but um, we can put axis 1 at is one to the number of columns of uh, array data. And what do we want to put there? We want to put the call names of array data there. And now it's over plotting them, which is a little bit annoying. And actually I have to do minus one to throw away the first yeah, because we have the sequence column in there so I don't want to have the sequence in there so let's do it like this and then say LAS is 2 to flip them around alright so then it looks like this so I, yeah, of course because it's the it's the artist palette model right so I'm just doing one by one adding things to the plot um, and it, it just over plots them but I can just close the plot and then say well give me a new plot why is it not disabling my axis actually? Oh, yes, it's in the as numeric. That's the reason. All right. And I want to disable the x axis. Okay, so what I'm saying is take the original data, throw away the sequence column, and then don't plot an x axis. And then I'm going to say make a custom x axis, so axis 1 at the x axis, at 1 to the number of calls of array data minus one. It, yeah, syntax highlighting. Yeah, that's why I try to do most of the things in Notepad++. Um, Notepad++ has syntax highlighting also for R. Um, so it just looks a little bit better. Um, oh, um, 
right? So here you can say that it has kind of minor, um, but it, it, it's okay-ish, right? So here you can say that length and which are there. Um, but normally a lot of people, and I think also a lot of students, they use RStudio. Um, so you don't have that issue because I think RStudio has syntax highlighting within the text editor there. Um, but all right, so but let me show you how the adjustment worked, right? So we just add the axis. I'm just going to make the window a little bit smaller. So I'm going to add the axis, right? So here we see the individual things, and I'm still not liking that this thing is here. So I'm just going to say, don't give me an X label either, and then just add the axis, right? So here we see the original measurements for hypothalamus gonadal fat, more hypothalamus, more gonadal fat, and now I'm going to use points, and I'm now going to take the same gene, right, number three, Uh, I have a question on plotting. I heard that it's useful to use source on save when plotting and adding many things and start the plot from zero. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of what I'm trying to always do. I'm always trying to not use the basic R plot. I, I generally make an empty plot and then start adding things to the plot. Um, I don't know what you mean by source on save when plotting. Because I, I I don't think that base R has a source on save. Um, um, anyway, so I have my corrected data now, which I want to add to the plot. So from the corrected data, I'm also going to take the third one. In this case, there's no sequence in the corrected data, so I can just do it like that. And then I'm just going to say color is um, green. Uh, that's a little bit of a shame, so use the plot do the axis and then uh, make the green dots but do PCH equals 18 so make them filled right um, and green is probably not the best color so make them red all right so now here in black we have the original values and here in um, red we have the adjusted values so hey you can see what happens so the when I did the adjustment for this gene it chose gonadal fat as the kind of default group right so gonadal fat didn't get adjusted and you can see that by the fact that none of the head that the green dots and the black dots exactly overlap but the adjustment here because I did a model and I take and one of the two groups gets a beta right you can see that the beta for hypothalamus just moved all of the points from the hypothalamus up to the mean of the of the gonadal fat group and that is how this kind of adjustment works, right? Because I have two groups, so what it does, it calculates the mean of both groups, and then one group doesn't get an adjustment. In this case, gonadal fat didn't get an adjustment because it's the first group. And then the second group, so hypothalamus, got the adjustment. So this just removed the effect of the tissue. And by removing the effect of the tissue, we're better able to see if there is a difference between the different samples, so between the different strains. Um, I will Google your source on save because I'm I'm not too sure what source on save is. Our source on save. Ah, source on save is something which is um, um, unique to our studio. Um, I read it online and it was in German, so... Oh, okay, I can read it in German, so... It's a function in RStudio. Den ganzen relevante Code für den Grafik mit Daten und allen drum und dran und ein extra Skript reinmachen und in RStudio für den Skript den Haken bei Source on Save setzen. Dann wird den Grafikcode bei Abspeichern jedes andere automatisch neu ausgeführt. Oh, that sounds very, very smart, actually, to do that. That sounds very smart. That sounds very smart to do. You can't do that with the standard R. So you can't make a... Um, um, but yeah, RStudio, because it is aware of the different data sets that you have loaded in, if you make changes to your data set, it can more or less um, figure that out, right? So if, if it looks, if you plot like the first row of the matrix, right? And then you change one number in the first row of the matrix, RStudio picks that up and then the source on save thing means that it will just automatically update the picture. Um, but basic R can't do that. 
All right, I've been talking for one hour and 13 minutes now, so um, I'm just going to stop my recording for YouTube. So YouTube will be right back. Um, and for you guys,